How do you take zero trust theory and turn it into reality? In part one of our zero trust series, we covered the core concepts of zero trust architecture as defined by NIST 800-207. While NIST and other publications provide strong conceptual frameworks, they stop short from providing guidance on how to implement these principles in the real world. In this video, we're going to take it a step further by bridging the gap between theory and implementation. We'll map each of the conceptual components, like policy enforcement points and policy engines, to real-world technologies you're probably already familiar with, such as firewalls, identity providers, and endpoint protection platforms. By the end of the video, you should have a solid understanding of the components of Zero Trust Framework and how they map to real products and technologies. Let's start by reviewing some of the key concepts we covered in Part 1 of this series. Specifically, that in Zero Trust, there is no more concept of a traditional perimeter, on-net or off-net but rather every single communication on a network involves the subject, the policy decision and enforcement point, and the resource. The resource is a system, application, or data being protected. The subject is typically a user or device attempting to access a resource from anywhere in the world. And sitting in between is a policy decision and enforcement point, responsible for deciding if access should be granted and then enforcing the decision in real time. At the heart of the entire Zero Trust model are the two critical components of the policy decision and enforcement point. The decision point is responsible for making decisions on whether a subject is allowed access to the requested resource and under what conditions. The enforcement point, on the other hand, enforces decisions made by the decision point. It sits in line, close to the resource, and either permits or blocks access based on what the decision point instructs. At a high level, this diagram represents the core concept framework of a zero trust architecture. Now let's explore how these concepts translate into real world technologies and how they're actively being implemented in modern environments today. Let's start with the policy enforcement point. In zero trust, the enforcement point is where enforcement actually happens. It's a gatekeeper that sits between the subject and the resource, either allowing or blocking based on the decision made upstream by the decision point. The key here is proximity. The enforcement point should be as close to the resource as possible, whether that's a server in a data center, a SaaS application, or a microservice in the cloud. The closer you enforce access to the service itself, the lower the exposure and harder it becomes for an attacker to move laterally within your network. Depending on where the resource lives and how it's accessed, the enforcement point can consist of different technologies and products altogether. For resources that live inside a traditional data center or campus network, the enforcement point typically consists of a network or application layer device deployed in line within the traffic. This might include a next generation firewall or NGFWs, such as Fortinet or Palo Alto. This may also include STP gateways, such as Zscaler or Netscope's private access. Network access controls can also work as an enforcement point. Typical example of this could be a Cisco ICE or Forescout appliance. Additionally, micro-segmentation solutions such as Illumio or Cisco Secure Workload can also act as a policy enforcement point. The type of technology used to implement PEP largely depends on the vendor, the type of product portfolio that they have, and their particular area of expertise. And while a detailed comparison is beyond the scope of this video, it's important to understand that each solution comes with its own strengths and weaknesses. For instance, traditional next-gen firewalls offer a broad set of built-in security features, but they may be less flexible in being able to control east-to-west traffic within a network. On the other hand, solutions like STP gateways, NAC platforms, and other micro-segmentation tools may not offer all the broad support of security inspection, but they're purpose-built as lightweight, cheaper solutions that allow you to enforce access closer to the resource, aligning tightly with the Zero Trust principles. Ultimately, the most important factor in selecting the right enforcement point isn't just the technical capabilities. It's ensuring that it fully integrates with your policy decision point. In fact, the decision to purchase or deploy a PEP should go hand in hand with your choice of the policy decision point that you ultimately select. The two must be compatible, work seamlessly together, and align with your organization's policy enforcement needs. The policy decision point is arguably the most critical component in the entire Zero Trust architecture. It's the brains of the system, the place where access decisions are made based on dynamic policy, contextual signals, and real-time risk. And just like the enforcement point, the decision point isn't just a single product or device. It's a logical function, and the name and structure will vary depending on the vendor. 
Some platforms may call this a policy engine, while others may call it a ZTNA controller or access broker. While the terminology changes, the role remains the same. This is part of the architecture responsible for ultimately making the decision and must satisfy the core tenets we reviewed in part one of this video. These include dynamic evaluation of identity, authentication, device posture, location, and risk signals. This also includes continuous input from internal and external sources as we'll review shortly. A key component is that it must provide ephemeral session-based authorization, which can be revoked at any time. And lastly, and possibly most important, integration with enforcement points. Some examples of a policy engine include modern SASE controllers such as Zscaler ZPA Policy Engine, Cloudflare One, or Fortis SASE's Orchestrator. Since SASE is built on zero trust, many of these core requirements are baked into the design of these modern solutions. But decision points aren't just SASE based. In fact, they could be purpose built solutions such as StrongDM or Google's Beyond Corp. What matters most isn't what is called, it's ultimately rather the system can ingest relevant context into its policy engine and make dynamic decisions in real time based on the tenants above. Now, at a minimum, the decision point must integrate with identity providers, which supply key authentication context such as multi-factor authentication status, user identity, and group membership. Next, the decision point should also account for data access policies. These define the type of data a user is allowed to access based on factors like classification levels, sensitivity, and other regulatory controls. But the real power of Zero Trust lies in the decision point's ability to ingest real-time signals that reflect the current state of users, devices, and surrounding environments. That's why it's essential for any solution to understand telemetry from the endpoint, the very device a user is connecting in from. Endpoint tools or agents provide critical data points such as device certificates, security posture, operating system health, threat activity, and overall compliance status. Endpoint platforms like CrowdStrike Falcon, Microsoft Defender, and Sentinel One are examples of endpoint security clients that can feed this type of information directly into the decision point to support the dynamic, context aware access decision that it ultimately needs to make for every user request. SIM platforms like Splunk, QRadar, or Elastic Security can also contribute broader threat intelligence by aggregating logs and alerts from nearly any device, system, or application on the environment. This integration gives a decision point a holistic view of what's happening beyond just a user device, such as recent brute force attempts into a network device, lateral movement indicators, or other suspicious behavior on adjacent systems. The decision point can also ingest signals from external threat intelligence sources, including IP reputation databases, geolocation data, anonymized traffic detection, and commercial threat feeds. All of these internal and external inputs are fed into the decision point's algorithm, which are then evaluated against the organization's defined access policies. If the access request meets all the criteria, the decision point renders an approval decision and passes it to the policy administrator which is responsible for provisioning session-specific ephemeral credentials and coordinating with the policy enforcement point to grant access. NIST 800-207 describes the policy engine and policy administrator as two separate functions within the decision point. The separation is important conceptually because it helps define clear roles. One component makes a decision while the other carries it out. But in real-world implementations, these two functions are almost always tightly integrated and often live inside a single platform or control point. Whether it's called ZTNA controller, Zero Trust Gateway, or just part of the identity access platform, the solution typically handles both policy evaluation and enforcement orchestration. The key part in the relationship between the conceptual policy engine and administrator is a decision logic provides ephemeral access, which means that every session is temporal and can be revoked at any time. This is where tight integration between the decision point and enforcement point become absolutely critical, especially if they come from different vendors. While the idea of a best of breed architecture is appealing in theory, in practice, it often introduces complexity. The enforcement point must be able to understand and validate the ephemeral credentials issued by the decision point, and both components need to communicate in real time to handle policy updates, revoke access as necessary, and maintain a consistent, verified trust posture. 
Because of this, many organizations prefer a single vendor zero trust platform where the decision point and enforcement point are part of the same system, designed to work together natively. This eliminates integration gaps, simplifies policy management, and ensures that access enforcement remains consistent, reliable, and in real time. Regardless of the vendor or architecture approach you choose, the foundation of any zero trust solution must remain the same. At its core, zero trust is anchored in a few non-negotiable principles, continuous verification, dynamic, context-aware policy evaluation, and ephemeral access that can be revoked instantly if risk levels changes or trust credentials are not met. Well, that wraps up another video, you guys, but I hope you found it informative. If you received any value at all, my only ask is you take a moment to hit like down below to give me a boost in the YouTube algorithm, which will help others see this video and content like this. That being said, if you haven't subscribed, please take a moment to subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this and stay on top of our latest releases.